Um, it is uh, my pleasure to introduce our guest today, Stephen Kopitz. He is the managing director at Douglas Westwood. Uh, he joined Douglas Westwood in 2008 and manages their New York uh, based office. He has more than 20 years of experience in strategic management consulting and investment banking. And most importantly, uh, he's an alumnus of SIPA, uh, having completed his master's in international affairs here, specializing in international economics. So please welcome me and join us, Stephen. Thank you, everybody. I can now tell you that Midman, Midtown Manhattan is only an hour from here. Um, you know, I had to come a long way, and uh, but, uh, but be that this way, and be that as it may, uh, thank you for waiting for me uh, uh, patiently here, and it's a pleasure to be here. Um, today, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, oil and the economy and some of the methodologies that we use. This is going to be a semi-academic talk, uh, which means that <clears throat> people in the industry wouldn't give me the time of day for this, but since you're, you're here at an academic institution, uh, I'll lean on you a little bit for methodology, and then also some of our findings. Um, I work for Douglas Westwood. We're a UK-based company. We do market research and commercial due diligence in oil field services. That means we count widgets for large companies. Our clients are uh, companies like GE Oil and Gas, FMC, Cameron, Baker Hughes, Schlumberger, and virtually all the private equity funds who invest in uh, oil field services. Uh, we have offices around the world uh, in, uh, in London, Singapore, Houston, New York, which I run, uh, Canterbury, or really Faversham, scenic downtown Faversham, and uh, in Aberdeen, Scotland. All right. So today I'm going to talk a little bit first about methodologies that we use and how our methodologies differ from other people who have also spoken at this uh, podium, guys like Antoine Haff or Mark Finley. Um, and so while um, I think I, their work is very important, we follow it and we count on it, we also have our own interpretation uh, of events, which in some ways differ materially from the ones that, that you, you, uh, many of you have seen them present here. So traditionally, when you do forecasting, and many of you who are students will end up doing forecasting at investment banks or consultancies, um, you tend to do demand-constrained forecasting. That it's demand-driven forecasting where you start from the top and go to the bottom, and the top is going to be typically GDP growth, which you might get from the IMF or domestically from the Fed or the CBO. Um, and then you multiply that by some coefficient to get uh, demand growth for whatever you like, whether that's automobiles or housing, or in our case, oil. Um, so oil demand is on a function of GDP growth with some variance, and then that in turn leads to supply growth, right? So supply follows demand. That's traditional forecasting, and if you're a forecaster or an analyst, you could spend your whole career and never use any other methodology than this. So if you say a BP forecast, this is what they mean. Now, what we've been using for oil and gas is supply-constrained forecasting, supply-driven forecasting. If you have a shortage commodity, then essentially you know that you'll be able to sell everything that you can make, right? So you know the volumes that will be taken in the marketplace. Really, you're just debating prices. So in our case, we take the oil supply as endogenous, right? We then say oil demand will essentially be 100% of oil supply, and then the linkage to GDP is then a function of, of that oil supply growth, okay? So let's take a look at the two different approaches. By the way, <clears throat> in oil and gas, the way you separate the men from the boys is with acronyms. Uh, I will tend to use them sometimes reflexively. If you don't understand what I'm saying, raise your hand and stop me and I will explain. Because a lot of these are, are terms that we use every day, so I may not appreciate that you don't know them. That doesn't mean you need to suffer through without asking what they are. So as I mentioned, this is traditional demand-driven forecasting. Everybody uses this, all the investment banks, all the oil majors, uh, the US and foreign governments all use this. <clears throat> so in this case, if you take a look, and we'll discuss BP a little bit here, but you start with GDP growth, then you get oil demand growth, and from them, oil supply growth. Now, the way their model works is that the residual, if you have something left over that you need to cut or augment, that is done in traditional oil markets forecasting with the so-called call on OPEC. It's as though King Abdullah has a nice red phone sitting by his table, his nightstand, and whenever someone needs more oil, they have the call on OPEC. I can leave aside as to you know, what kind of 
implications this have. If you said, you know, for car makers, there's a call on Kia. After everybody else manufactures as much as they want, then we call up Kia, and they can manufacture the, the residual. Um, but that's the way oil markets forecasting works. Okay, so OPEC is the one that goes up and down and balances out supply and demand in traditional demand constrained forecasting. Here's from BP's Energy Outlook 2013. Unfortunately, I couldn't attend Mark Finley's presentation here a couple of weeks ago. I have looked at it, it's not much different from last year's. But this is the way you, if you were looking for whether someone is forecasting by demand or by supply, you could read clues in the text that they write. So here it says global liquids consumption growth slows to 0.8% per annum. So demand slows, okay? So the presumption is that demand is doing something. And then further, you can go on farther down, it says OECD demand has peaked. Again, so it is demand who's doing the driving here, okay? And further then, demand growth slows and non-OPEC supplies rise and OPEC members will cut production over the current decade to give us spare capacity, okay? So here's the call on OPEC. This is as, as it's written in BP's program. I've chosen BP because they have actually a very nice outlook, um, not because there's something unique about it. It's a standard presentation, okay? So if we take a look, the way BP solves the, the oil supply growing faster than their anticipated demand is essentially by OPEC taking production offline, by increasing spare capacity. And if you look there, there's a kind of an implication, what Mark has done here, it's actually interesting to see, you know, whenever you use pictures and charts and graphs, don't kid yourself, you're always being an editor, right? You're always shaping how people perceive things. When you do pictures, when you do presentations like this, after a while, you, you really know how to spin things, unfortunately, but it goes with it. But you can see that Mark has thrown in here the second, both the peaks. The, the, the first larger peak is after the first oil shock, right? And then there was a lot of, lot of new production came online, demand collapsed, and there was a huge overhang of capacity. And then there's some anticipation that that kind of period comes again with this huge amount of increase in capacity. A lot of it has to be taken offline. Um, and that's the way we solve a situation with little demand and, and relatively good supply, okay? Now, there are some assumptions built into this approach and analysis. Those are that GDP growth is endogenously weak. So if GDP is not growing fast, it has nothing to do with oil. You can be a Keynesian, you can be a market monetarist and say it's not enough spending or not enough uh, e easy money, but GDP in this view is taken as exogenous and it's weak and that has nothing to do with oil. Secondly, there's a presumption that social uh, taste or demographics has changed and that has led to a lower trajectory trajectory for oil demand growth, okay? So something has happened. Why don't we have that demand growth that we had 15 years ago? Well, something has changed out there uh, in there. OPEC is central, right? OPEC is central. It has enormous leverage in the way that BP has described um, their equation. If OPEC doesn't exercise market discipline and reduce production, then oil prices will crash. Right? That's the presumption of that analytical framework. And a little bit with that, that oil prices are somehow balanced on a knife's edge. Right? If King Abdullah fails to pick up his phone, it's all quite fragile. So that's demand constraint. So let's go now to supply constraint. A supply constraint is a binding constraint view of economic growth. Just as, say, water is a binding constraint on economic activity, on agricultural activity in the desert, Right? We take the view here that oil is a binding constraint. If there's not enough, it's a binding constraint on economic growth. Okay? So you can have lots of constraints, but not all of them are binding. So for example, if labor markets have slack, as they do now in the US, we would not think that's binding. If interest rates are very low, then we would say the capital is probably not a binding constraint. Okay? So there are many constraints that may be binding from time to time, Oil and energy may be binding constraints, but not necessarily at any given moment in time. We're arguing that in general, in this recent period, oil has been a binding constraint on economic activity, okay? So we start from the oil supply. If the oil demand is greater than the oil supply growth, then observed demand growth will actually be less than inherent demand growth. So if you had given the economy more oil, it would have taken it, okay? To convert that into GDP, we have some efficiency factor of how efficiently we can increase our, our use of, of, of oil, right? And that's a number, and that tells us the linkage between oil and economic growth. 
so in this case, we start with oil, we end with GDP, um, and the residual in this model is not the call on OPEC, it's GDP growth, okay? So if you have a flower and you don't have a lot of water, you give it a little water, it grows, but if you can give it more water, it'll grow more. However, once it's watered, if you give it more water, it doesn't necessarily grow more. So there's a range in which this model works. Okay, so for us, what do we need to de demonstrate that we might have the conditions for a supply constrained uh, situation? So we'd like to see that demand is likely higher than what we've seen in observed supply-demand equilibria. We'd like to show that the oil supply is constrained, that oil is a key enabling commodity, right, that there's some linkage to GDP, that it seems to be materially affecting the economy, that efficiency gains won't be enough to offset a lack of oil, and that GDP growth is off-trend somehow. Also, we'd like to show that peak demand theories or, or assertions are not well-founded, um, and that Oil price, prices are sustaining even in the face of supply growth in excess of, of forecast demand, okay? So now we're going to, so now we've set up supply constraint versus demand constraint. We are now going to look at some tests and, and take a look and see how the data fit our models and do the data support them or refute them. All right, so let's look at supply growth. So um, oil demand historically increases by about three quarters of the rate of GDP growth globally, okay? If we looked at this, and, and this would imply by itself about 23% oil consumption growth from 2004 to 2013. In fact, what we saw was 7.5% supply growth. If we use this methodology, even allowing for efficiency gains, normal and accelerated, we're still short more than 10 million barrels, 12 million barrels. So something like the equivalent of a Saudi Arabia and an Iraq combined. And that's why we argue that oil prices are expensive, okay? But it's not, this is actually a little bit worse than this chart shows here because what is that 7.5% oil supply growth? So let's, let's break down that growth. So total production, um, liquids production, this is crude and NGLs, is up just about 6 million barrels a day since 2005, of which a little bit less than two are OPEC natural gas liquids. Natural gas liquids are typically a byproduct of gas production, not oil production. So, so while they are treated as part of the crude oil, of liquids, the oil supply, the oil supply broadly defined, they are in fact not related primarily to crude, but rather to gas production. OPEC liquids production, including NGLs, are largely unchanged since 2005. In almost nine years now, there's really not much change out of OPEC. What we do say big change is the U.S. unconventional liquids, that's shale oil and natural gas liquids associated with gas production, are 5 million barrels per day, literally all of the net crude oil production growth in the world since 2005, okay? To this, we can add Canadian oil sands, which are up over a million barrels since that time. But if we look at the legacy oil system, which existed in 2005, so not oil sands and not shale oils, but everything else, onshore, offshore, Russia, Mexico, Venezuela, uh, Argentina, Saudi Arabia, Australia, Indonesia, Thailand, Malaysia, all the rest of those are down since 2005, okay? So the conventional oil supply, the legacy oil supply as it existed in 2005, peaked in 2005, and that is still true today. This is a very important point. If you attend presentations by Tom Eisenberg, the chief, chief economist of, of, of ExxonMobil, or Chris Rule from BP, you know, one of the questions they typically ask is, well, do you believe in peak oil? And I found myself one of the lone guys who said, put up my hand, yes, I do. You know, if you ever feel like peer pressure on the professional front, you can put up your hand when Tom Eisenberg from, from Exxon uh, asked that question, and you know you're going against the grain. But the, the truth of the matter is that while it is true that the oil supply has not peaked as such, it is higher than it was. All of that growth has come from unconventionals, okay? We're entirely leveraged to unconventionals for the oil supply growth today. And that's one thing that, that Chris and Tom typically don't convey in their presentations. <clears throat> All right. If we look at OPEC, um, there's not too much here. I think it is important to note that there are significant and relatively high historical outages in Nigeria, Libya, and uh, Iran. Um, for different reasons, Nigeria's political instability, Iran is the embargo, and Libya is going up and down like a yo-yo now, depending upon their, uh, sort of in the wake of the whole uh, revolution there. Uh, they, they have a good bit of supply that came on just this past month. 
We'll have more data on that with the EIA report. Uh, it's probably out right now. Okay, so it's there's not a huge change here. There is some latent supply lying around of a million to a million and a half barrels that theoretically could find its way back to markets in relatively short order. Libya is the, the primary source of that. Now, how much did all this oil cost us? So since 2005, we have spent about $4 trillion on upstream spend. That's exploration and production. That includes things like drilling, drilling services and production platforms. Uh, it doesn't include midstream pipelines. It doesn't include refineries or retail. This is just finding and getting the oil. So $4 trillion, for those of you, the GDP of Germany is $3.5 trillion. So since 2005, we have spent more than a year's GDP of Germany just looking for oil and gas. So a lot, tremendous amount of money. Of this $4 trillion, about $350 billion has been spent on U.S. and Canadian unconventionals, and another $150 billion. Uh, this will be online, by the way. So you're, you can, you, there's a simpler way to get this than photographing. In fact, if you like, you can just sketch it down quickly. But uh, you can, no, no, that didn't, it didn't fly. Okay, well, I'll try a different joke later. Um, so, so 350 on unconventionals, another 150 billion on LNG and GTL. So you have about three and a half trillion dollars, the GDP of Germany, that was spent on maintaining the legacy oil and gas system in the last seven or eight years. Uh, of this, about two and a half trillion was spent on crude oil production alone, which is 93, not 94, 93 percent of petroleum liquids today. And that two and a half trillion dollars bought us a decline in production of about one million barrels per day. So we spent more than the GDP of, of Italy to reduce our oil production by a million barrels per day compared to 2005. This is not something that you read very often in the press, right? You would think if we smoked the GDP of Italy, someone would have noticed, but in fact, it's not often commented. Just for purposes of comparison, in 98 to 05, so a seven-year stretch, we spent $1.5 trillion and added 8.6 million barrels per day of crude production. So we have historically added a lot more production for a lot less money. Okay, 2005 is a fulcrum year, and you'll see that in the data. Um, so, yeah, that's where we are. We spent not too much money for significant growth in unconventionals, and we've spent an unbelievable amount of money to try to hold down the front on the legacy system of 2005. And we're really struggling. And that's also not something you hear very often. Let's talk about demand growth. So we see, hear the assertion from BP and others like it that demand growth is very small, 0.8% per year. Well, does that correspond to historical precedents for this type of development? In the 1960s, between 1960 and 1972, we saw the motorization of the West, which included Western Europe, the residual motorization of the United States, and all that of Japan. That was about 1.2 billion people. And in 12 years, we added 30 million barrels of consumption from 60 to 72. Okay, 30 million barrels in 12 years, quite a, lot, quite, a, quite a lot of supply, from 20 to 50 in 12 years. Now we are seeing the motorization of the East, primarily of China, but also of other emerging economies. That's 1.3 billion people, depending upon how you want to count them. We have increased crude production by 4 million barrels per day over eight years. Okay, so we haven't added very much compared to what we would have expected to see based on historical precedent. In fact, based on historical precedent, we would expect demand to be increasing by about 2.7% per year. So if you're going, China's a big country, and if you're gonna make room for China, that's about the room that you would ex anticipate to make. So our anticipations, our ex ante anticipations of demand growth uh, for this period, say from 2005 to 2025, would be much higher, 2.7% rather than what we've seen. And here's China. So if you take an analysis of China as Korea or Japan, well, you can take Korea and Japan. Japan is in red and Korea is in blue. Mm -hmm. The difference between Korea and Japan, that flat part, that's the second oil shock. So Korea's demand during the second oil shock from 1979 to about 1976 was essentially flat. Okay, And then OPEC threw in the towel, and all of a sudden, Korea's demand again took off at the same trajectory as Japan's had 20 years earlier. So what's the read out of that? The read is, if there's cheap oil around, it will be taken. And what's suppressing China's demand is not a lack of demand from China, it's a lack of affordable oil, okay? How much demand is there in China? China has added historically uh, in the five years to 2007. It added, it added a US worth of coal consumption in five years. In the five years to 2012, it added another US worth of coal consumption. 
and it will probably add another one to 2020. Okay? That's how big China is. It's a really, really big country. And it can add a U.S. worth of consumption from nothing in five years. Okay? It has the potential right now to add two U.S.'s worth of consumption to steady state, which should be around 2030, 2035, depending upon how things go. So it can add a whopping amount of consumption in very short order, okay? both based on its historical and our, on our anticipated for that economy. China's about half of oil consumption growth, most of it from, well, virtually all of it from the non-OECD countries. So if you put that all together but between now and 2020, 2030, it wouldn't be particularly hard to add 50 or 60 million barrels of consumption if the oil were cheap and readily available. Okay? That would be the pattern in the 1960s, for example. That's not 0.8% per year. Now, if we take a look at the supply out in 2030, it's a range. Exxon, BP, and the EIA put the anticipated supply at about one, a little over 100 million barrels to 107. BP is up this number a little bit, but not much. It's still in this range. On the lower end, we have Total and the IEA. I guess that's the French influence there. They're 95, 96. And then the peak oil guys, some of them are 75 without consideration of shales. These are all really essentially peak oil forecasts. None of them would cover another 50, 60 million barrels. Right? We're at 90 million barrels today, so 107. You have maybe another 15 million barrels that they think we can put on right now. Right? We say China alone could take that and then take it again, and then that would be half of growth. So in essence, these are all peak oil forecasts. None of these really uh, assume uh, full accommodation of the oil supply to likely demand. Okay, and they haven't changed much. It's actually quite a bit of consensus around these numbers, or I don't know if it's consensus or rather complacency, but no one feels that these were hotly debated uh, four or five years ago. Uh, right now, pretty much everybody is happy to let them sit here, so we can call it consensus for the moment. Okay. Now, if you say, well, big China, how do we make room for a big China? Right? If there's not enough oil to go around, how do we accommodate China? Well, that's pretty simple. China bids away everybody else's oil consumption. And we can model that out. That's actually not that hard to model if you sit down and, and do it. And you can calculate that at 100 million barrels by 2030, just to pick a number, that could be a little higher, a little lower, but let's pick 100. Um, where you end up is that for a country like the US or, or Europe, we would expect a decline of 1.5% per year in consumption uh, and 2.3% on a per capita basis, although our per capitas are falling so fast, probably those will be aligned. And guess what? Europe is right on track for that. They're right down. They're down 16% since 2005. They're right at 1.5%. U.S. is at 14% down since 2005. And that's an interesting thing which we'll talk about. But in essence, that model has worked in the past, and, uh, and so that's, it gives us a feel for what could happen. All right. So this is another view of this, and we can see that since December 2007, the start of the Great Recession, OECD, that's advanced country consumers, consumers, not producers, have provided 50% of non-OECD emerging market consumption, okay, by seeding their own consumption. And that number is about a quarter over the last year. So where are the Chinese going to drill for oil? They are drilling for oil first and foremost on Main Street USA. Right? They're just bidding away the consumption of, of incumbent users because that's the only place to go. Right? So you bid, up the, you bid it up and then the guys who use a lot release it and that's the process we've seen. There's nothing abnormal or strange about that. The only thing abnormal or strange is that China's reaching this phase now, right, which is, has to do with its history had it been developed like Korea, we would have had these pressures in 1995, 1996, rather than almost 20 years later. I would point out to you that the countries who have experienced fiscal and financial crisis are without exception on the bottom half of that graph. So Iceland, Ireland, US, Britain, Germany, Greece, Portugal, Italy, every one of them is on the lower half, and not one of them on the top half experienced a crisis. So this Great Recession was something that was truly an advanced country phenomenon, not an emerging country phenomenon, which is quite counterintuitive by historical patterns. All right, oil prices. So there are a couple of different things. So the question is, how does supply constraint then affect uh, oil prices or our view of oil prices? Okay, there are essentially three different views of oil prices today. One of these is the futures curve, that takes you back to about ninety dollars in twenty twenty on a Brent basis. Another is what I would call the operator's forecast, 
which right now they're not quite sure how the heck to forecast prices. So they said, well, let's use $100, and $100 is a good number. And you can see this also in investment banking forecasts. You can see it if you talk to the, the operators themselves. Well, we'll use 100. But they don't know why, other than it seems like a number that might work. Our forecast is higher. Um, our forecast says, well, what we would anticipate is as we move forward, countries become more efficient at using oil. So as GDP grows, as efficiency grows, with dollar inflation, we would expect to see oil prices rise over time. Okay. So that puts us near the top of the forecasting deck. It puts us below Barclays, but in that range. It puts us well above Goldman and well, well above Citi. Okay. So why no price collapse in 2013? If you've seen presentations in this room, you'll see that supply was intended to outgrow demand. In fact, I've seen charts where they show that, but no price collapse, right? If you believed inherent, uh, if you believed observed supply and demand, you would say, well, all that excess supply should have collapsed prices, but it didn't, right? Prices have been rock steady. They're $109 and really only two or three dollars what they were more than two years ago. So we've had good supply growth and virtually no movement downwards in, in oil prices. On the other hand, if you believe that inherent demand is greater than supply growth, then as soon as oil becomes available on the market, it's sucked up very quickly. Okay? It's like if you gave a, a plant that was starved for water, you poured a little water on it, very quickly it would absorb that, grow, right? and then if you have more water, it would like, like to take that. Okay? So the issue is not that the plant doesn't want the water and that's why it's not growing, it's that you're not giving it enough water and if you would, it would grow faster. All right. There are two caveats on supply constraint forecasting that are important to understand. First, our supply constraint model depends intrinsically on demand from China. So the basic model is there's not enough oil to go around, China needs a lot of oil, and therefore China will bid away the oil consumption of the incumbent users, the OECD economies, right? It's pretty simple. If you have someone who comes to the table who wasn't there before, and supply doesn't grow, and they say, well, I'd like to participate, then obviously the price is going to go up, and the guys who used to get that are going to cede some of that to the newcomer. It's not a, it's, there's nothing particularly it's simple supply and demand. But what's important is that China, since the beginning of last year, has shown continuously decelerating demand growth for oil consumption. And you can see it there, the last peak on the right, going down. I'm not sure why. I'm not sure how to interpret it. But China right now is not moving oil markets, or it wasn't a few weeks ago. Okay? China's out of the markets for the moment. I don't know why. Well, I, I have some sense why, but, but yes. Yes, yes, yes. So it's still increasing. It is. It is. But if you go to December, if you take Platts, then two out of the last three or four months were actually negative for China. And December is negative by the EIA. I'm telling you what they tell me. I, I'm not a, I don't count barrels in China. I do read the, do read the press, though. Oh, I understand, and, and the truth is that there are different interpretations for China, right? One is that it's just an anomaly, it'll pick up again. Another is that something worse will happen. Another is that some statistical thing that's just, there's a lot of sectoral, sectoral noise in China. For example, gasoline and jet fuel are up. Diesel and naphtha are significantly down. So you're getting sectoral realigns. In any event, the point here is, if China is not competing for those extra barrels very hard, right, then they're not setting the price. And that means that the person who is competing for those barrels very hard is going to set the price. And let's see who that is. Oh, yes, if you look at the gray line, you can see that that's the U.S. You remember the BP comment, though, OECD <clears throat> demand has peaked? Well, the U.S. added a million barrels of consumption in about six weeks. If the price is cheap, the U.S. has demonstrated that it can take supply very fast. Okay, so in this model, essentially, this model says that if China's not in the market, then you will see the U.S. and the Europeans, who are starved, right, they'll take that share that China's not competing for. And that's kind of what these statistics say. On the other hand, the question is how much latent demand is there in the U.S.? Let me go down another slide here. Here's our forecast. This is a forecast I made in 2009. It's in one of my articles. Um, an analysis I did earlier than that. But you can see here's in blue U.S. oil demand. And you can see the yellow line is long-term trend. And the dotted line would be our peak oil forecast based upon this chart here. That chart, okay? So that red dotted line corresponds to this chart here. 
Okay? And you can see that U.S. oil consumption has, in fact, by and large, really corresponded very much to what we predicted many years ago. In fact, the Europeans are dead on that red dotted line. They're actually right on it. Now, the question becomes um, how the U.S. is going to respond right now. We've started increasing our oil demand very quickly in the last quarter. Um, and then the question is, is this arising because China is not competing for this? So we have softer prices, the economy gets used to the oil price, everybody adjusts, and then you go, okay, then we can grow faster because now we've you know, digested that need to increase our efficiency. Or, conversely, is this the result of the U.S. increasing oil production? How much of our oil, incremental oil production do we get to consume? Is it nothing? Because up until the middle of last year, we had increased our oil production by 3 million barrels a day, and the U.S. had not consumed a single barrel of it. Virtually all of that went to the emerging economies. Okay? So now we have or 5 million barrels. The question is, does the U.S. get to consume any of those barrels, or do we export them all effectively as we did last before? We, we cut our net imports, to be more clear. Okay? So, and the answer is I don't know that, but I can tell you that, that for the U.S., if we're talking about U.S. consumption, one of the things we now have to calculate with is does increased U.S. production of oil affect U.S. consumption? That has a really important implications for, for example, our refinery sector. Do we need more refineries or fewer? Is refinery going to be a positive business or a negative business? Well, if consumption is falling as it is in Europe, the refiners are all dying there, right? But for us, if our consumption can go up because we're producing more, then our downstream outlook is correspondingly better. Oil and mobility. Historically, mobility and GDP have been synonymous. If you take a look at this chart, you can see how mobility and oil consumption has developed over years, with um, both of them indexed to 1970 equals 100. Okay. So you can see after 1970, oil consumption rose very quickly in the blue. First oil shock in the red. Consumption falls. Vehicle miles stagnate. Very quick presumption of oil consumption growth into the second and third oil, second oil shock. There's two recessions here, that purple line, although it looks like one on paper. And then we have that long sloping thing in the middle, right? Anybody know what that period's called since it's actually on the graph? I feel like Mr. Professor now. Right? That period is called great moderation. From the time OPEC threw in the towel in 1984-ish up until about 2005. Right? This is the Alan Greenspan period. And during this period, oil consumption both grew and vehicle miles grew as well in the U.S. as, as elsewhere. Right? This is an era of overhang of supply. And we can go back, if you recall, BP's chart with that big excess capacity. Right? That excess capacity is created in the purple line the second oil shock. The Saudis keep a high oil price. Lots of capacity comes online. Vehicle efficiency improves greatly, and you can see that there. And all of a sudden, we had an overhang in 1984 equal to 25% of consumption. And it took us a generation to absorb that. Okay? So oil prices were low throughout that period. That period ended in about 2005, 2003, depending on how you count it. Stalls out there at the top. And then we go into the second Great Recession uh, which is the third, oil, third modern oil shock, and immediately in the Arab Spring into the fourth modern oil shock. And you can see that, in fact, uh, from an oil and vehicle miles traveled perspective, the period after 2007 looks a great deal like the period after 1979. We can see this in another view. This is people, this is from D.S. Short. D.S. Short does they, great graphs. There's some people who are just great graphers out on the internet, and he's one of them. Um, this is the civilian non-institutional population, so I guess you're all institutionals here. Um, no, you're really not, but uh, not that kind of institution, age 16 and over, and his population adjusted vehicle miles. You can see that vehicle miles traveled peaks in 2005, not 2007. It peaks with the oil supply in 2005. That's when the oil supply stalls out. And it continues to decline to the modern day. Okay, So that's a society who's significantly losing mobility. So if mobility is growth, then it's also losing growth. And you can compare this period to the first oil shock, which is the first little hump, came and went pretty fast. Second oil shock, by comparison, came and went pretty fast. And this one, which is just bending the curve down without relief. 
Okay. This is also true for peak car ownership, which occurred in 2006. Again, it predates the recession. And you may say, well, that's because uh, people are retiring, you know, changing demographics, seniors don't want to drive. No, that's not true. If you take a look, seniors have become much more likely to buy cars than young people. Then you say, well, then it must be that young people don't want to drive, and that's not true either. If you take a look at the left, this is from a study by Michael Sivak from the University of Michigan Transportation Research Institute. Michael is an indispensable resource for these sorts of things. Um, they did a survey of the employment status of people without driver's licenses. And what they found was that only less than 19% of people in the survey aged 18 to 39 had full-time jobs. That's a horrible number. I, that was such a bad number, I, I, I went back and forth with Michael like four times on email going, you're sure, you're sure, you're sure, is the sample right? It can't be right. I mean, there are different ways to interpret it, but I, I, there's very few ways to interpret it that's charitable. Similarly, the Highway Data Loss Institute, which must be just a fantastic employer to work for, um, said, I'm being a little, little facetious, they actually have good data, um, concludes from one of their studies that employment represents, unemployment represents 80% of the reason why young people are driving less. So driving and employment are related. If you live in the U.S. outside of New York or Washington, D.C. or maybe San Francisco, then you know that if you want to be up and about, then pretty much you have to have a driver's license. And it's been that way for a long time. So th this is not particularly surprising, other than the fact that in the press they've been something, saying something else. And we can see evidence of oil price pressures on behavior. So here's again from Michael Sivak. Um, you can see that uh, average new car mileage has actually increased faster than CAFE standards. So that means that the consumer is actually demanding cars more efficient than those required by law. That would be an indication of price pressure, right? So it's not, a it's not an involuntary, it's a voluntary thing. On the other hand, if you see the chart to the right, we see new, new annual rate of improved mileage in new vehicles. And on the bottom is U.S. oil consumption. So if oil consumption is falling, that usually reflects pressure, oil price pressure, and we see increasing new vehicle mileage. Um, when oil consumption is rising, we tend to see that pressure taken off. So the answer is people prefer overall, as we pretty well know if you live in suburbia, um, that people prefer bigger, more powerful cars if they can afford them. Okay, so when the pressure's on, people get smaller cars. If the pressure's off, they get bigger cars. And the effect of, of efficiency mindsets on consumers fade pretty quickly. So 12 months, 24 months is a long time. People can change their behavior during that period. All right, it's not just cars, it's also airlines. U.S. commercial airline departures are 16% below their 2005 peak. Uh, passengers are not down that low because they've consolidated into larger aircraft and increased load factors, but departures are off, and they are 30% below their trend line. So if you go to LaGuardia or JFK, one in every three planes that we would have expected to see, even accounting for the recession, are not there. That's a big number. All right. So it's not just, going, it's not just cars, it's other sectors as well. Um, this is a U.S. Uh, consumption of different kinds of products. Um, ethane, ethylene, these are derived from natural gas liquids, of which we have a lot, and you can see the consumption is up 72% since 2005. So that's a whopping amount of increase, which just says if you have cheap energy or fuel, you tend to use cheap energy or fuel, and we have. There's been considerable substitution in, in uh, petrochemical and industrial processes. Uh, on the other hand, if you take a look at diesel fuel or gasoline, those have barely budged since 2005. Our efficiency gains in vehicle miles traveled divided by uh, oil and gasoline use is not great. Our efficiency gains, you know, if you divide how much we've traveled and how much gasoline we're using, it's not very good. It's a percent and a half since 2005. But people are holding on to their cars. What they're willing to give up is jet fuel, heating oil, and other stuff, distillate to power, these have been largely taken out of use in the United States since 2005. What has remained, what people are struggling to hold on to, is their driving habits, okay? Because that matters, because if you can't drive, you can't work. Not in New York. If you can't take the subway, you can't make your presentation in New York, but, okay. So, so this all suggests that we are short on oil, 
that oil remains expensive and that that expensive oil is preventing the economy from operating the way it has traditionally been accustomed to do so. Let's talk about the oil majors a little bit. Oil production has faltered, even as CapEx has soared. The oil majors, the oil majors here, just for the record, are, are British Gas, BP, Conoco, Chevron, ENI, Oxy, Petrobras, Shell, Statoil, Total, and Exxon. Okay, these are the primary traded public companies. So their production is exactly where it was, crude oil production is exactly where it was in 2000. In fact, it's down from where it was in 2008, 9, or 10. Um, but their capex is up by a factor of five, from 50 billion to 262 billion during that period. That's phenomenal. That means in nominal terms, the productivity of capital has fallen by a factor of five over a decade. Okay, that's a phenomenal unwind of an industry. Now, the way we've, we've managed to compensate, what we have done, and it, it, it's reflected broadly, this is from, from Barclays, is that we've increased CapEx every year by a lot. For, uh, capital expenditures. So CapEx, in this case, um, see, this is, this is where I get into trouble, because we use these things as though, you know, and, and then everybody's clueless, but that's, that's good. If you throw things at me, then that's probably too much, but it, raising hands, okay. Um, so CapEx is capital expenditures, what we would expend on things like factories, refineries, that sort of thing. Now, in, in our parlance, we use upstream spend, which is like CapEx. But the reason is that if you go out with a drilling unit, you rent a drilling, so Shell rents a drilling unit from Transocean, okay? I guess BP rents it from Transocean, but that's a different story. So, um, so they're paying a million dollars a day for this unit. Now, that's a rental charge, right? It, they're not getting an asset for that. That unit is going out and drilling a well, completing the well, and, and getting it all done. But it has the nature of being a capital expenditure, right? It's what you do to prepare a field for production. So it's treated as a CapEx item. It's an upstream spend, even though technically you don't really get an asset as such necessarily for it. Um, and the second thing is you might write it off as an expense if it's a dry hole. Okay, so if it's an exploration cost. But we treat those as capitalized expenditures because of the cost of finding and developing oil. So I tend to use CapEx here. We're talking upstream, which is finding and delivering oil, not refining it, not moving it around, not selling it. Okay, so I'm using CapEx and upstream spend as the same thing, even though they're not entirely. Okay, it's just a convenience and in, in the industry we're a little bit loose with those, those terms. All right, so... CapEx had been going up and up until recently, last six months, people thought, well, CapEx will continue to do very well. Okay, we've been on this trajectory forever, and, and we're just going to get more and more money out of this. Now, why is that? The reason is that in a demand-constrained model, for those of you who took economics, price equals marginal cost, right? So if my costs are going up, the price will also go up, right? That's a demand-constrained model. So if it costs me more to get oil, big deal. The market will recognize that at some point in a demand-constrained model, not in a supply-constrained model. In a supply-constrained model, the price goes up to a price that's very similar to the monopoly price, after which you really can't raise it because that marginal consumer would rather do, do with less than pay more. They will not recognize your marginal costs. In that model, you get to a price, and after that level, there's significant resistance from the consumer moving up off that price. That's the supply constraint price, okay? If your costs continue to come up underneath you, the consumer won't recognize it, right? This is implicitly a demand-constrained capex or spend forecast because it says, oh, spend can go up for a trillion dollars a year. Sure, we can spend trillion dollars a year looking for oil and gas. The global economy will accept that. Right? Whereas you start saying, well, gee, you know, how much will the global economy really accept? And actually, that number is calculable. Okay. So, in addition, it is also true that some sectors have done very well. We monitor subsea hardware sales for FMC. It's the primary vendor. And some have done really well. The first three quarters, this is related to deep water subsea production. This is subsea production hardware. So if you produce oil from an offshore field, you have to have well heads and manifolds and valves and things on the bottom. That's this stuff. Um, and that's done very well. But if we have seen profits have lagged in the industry as a whole because costs are rising faster than revenues, right? 
So ENP CapEx or spend per barrel has been rising by 11% of year, a year, and that's net of technology improvements. So that's, that's even including technology improvements. It's been rising by 11% per year, and Brent oil prices have been flat. So costs are coming up and revenues aren't. So a number of projects have consequently been deferred, canceled, or returned, and here are a few of them. Um, this, there was a number last spring to last summer, and we've had one or two since then, but uh, Chevron puts Rosebank, this is a UK project. Uh, cost overruns on Casberg, this is a Statoil project in Norway in the Arctic, they haven't been able to make that work. Uh, Hadrian North, this is an Exxon project in the Gulf of Mexico, and BP's Mad Dog 2, which is really a kind of a field extension in the Gulf of Mexico. The Mad Dog 2 is a, is a, is a somewhat disturbing uh, story here because uh, they, they had approved the orders for everything and then canceled them a month later. Um, and that wasn't thought to be that hard a project. Okay. So costs have outpaced revenues for 2 to 3% per year. And that means profitability is down by 10 to 20%. That's pretty much across the board at the majors. What does that mean? So if my costs are going up by 2 or 3%, well, you say, well, that doesn't sound so bad. Yes. But my profits are 10 to 15% of revenues, right? So if my costs go up by 2 or 3%, that means my profits go down by 20%. So, um, so if they want to, let me put it to you this way. If your profits were 10% of sales and your costs went up by 2%, two percentage points, then your profits would then be 8% of sales, right? So you go from 10% to 8%, a reduction of 20% in profits. And that's exactly what we're seeing across the board in the oil majors. In fact, if you take a look, the vast majority of public oil and gas companies now require prices over $100, and more than half of them need over $120. The fourth quartile needs $130 or more. Almost all the oil majors are in this category. Okay? So that's to maintain their capex and to maintain their dividends. So this is a chart from Goldman Sachs. Goldman, what they calculate is what price do these guys need to be able to meet their CapEx obligations, their programs, plus maintain their dividends, okay? Because all these companies have dividends, and it's very important. These are widow and orphan companies, right? So you have to make enough from your projects to cover your costs, and after covering your operating costs, also cover their CapEx requirements, and beyond that, to cover the dividends that you intend to pay, right? Shell this past year, I think it was Shell, borrowed money to pay its dividends. That's not a good thing. Okay. So that's where this industry is right now, where their cost structure is not supporting um, their, their cash outflows in essence, okay? How are they responding? So here's a, this is a slide we did um, back in the summer, but a little bit updated. Um, Shell here is, is, is sort of the litmus test. If you want to see what's going on in the industry, Shell is the company to watch. So during the summer, they decided to discontinue production guidance and focus on increased cash flow because the investors were saying, look, that's great that you want to grow on everything, but look at how much CapEx you put into this, and you guys haven't been able to increase production. And your oil prices aren't moving up. So forget growth, just give us cash. Demonstrate to us that you guys can generate cash returns. Okay. So they discontinued production guidance, and they said they would focus on increased cash flow. Now they've said they're not going to do Alaska in 2014. This is partly for, for other reasons as well, but it reflects uh, a general trend at Shell. And all the majors have announced divestment programs. Shell has announced a major divestment program to raise cash. Now, where do we go from here? So if your costs are rising faster than your revenues, the question is, does it make sense to sell your assets? Right? Does that solve your problem? Well, ordinarily, what you'd want to do if your costs were rising faster than your revenues is raise your revenues, but you can't do that because oil prices are dictated by markets. And cutting your costs becomes pretty darn hard because there's shortages in the oil industry as it is. So in essence, you get in a tough place. And so what they've done to generate cash to placate investors is to sell assets of various sorts to raise cash to pay dividends. But the question is, is this sustainable? Or how do we get back to some sort of level playing field? In this slide, we take a look at the legacy oil system from 2005. And if we take the view that it peaked in 2005, and that view seems to be still pretty good, then we would have anticipated that the oil uh, decline would have mirrored the pace of the gain to the peak. So in principle, if you look at a peaking oil system, 
it should be symmetrical around the peak. So you approach the peak and leave the peak at the same pace. Okay? If that were the case and 2005 were the peak, then we can see that the conventional oil supply did not decline as we would have, would have anticipated moving off the peak. It declined a little bit, but not much. What happened in between there was that yellow area on the chart. Right? That's the increment above what we would have expected to see in a normal pe peaking and declining system. How did we get that yellow chart, that yellow area? Well, we got that by throwing two and a half trillion dollars at the system, right? We put the whole system on steroids. And that's how we managed to hold that. Now, that strategy of throwing more money at it because, and you could do that because oil prices were increasing, that strategy has run its course. You're not able to do that anymore. So the question is, what happens then from this level of production? Do we go back to the, the the natural decline curve, and if so, at what speed, or can we maintain this yellow line or run parallel? We're beginning to see some data coming in to, to give us some views on this. So EMPs are cutting CapEx one after another. You can see Hess's CapEx is down 30% over two years. Shell is down 20% over this year. Uh, BG is down six. Stat oil is cutting costs and, and taking these things down. So these CapEx compression, which we talked a lot about last summer, is now really beginning to hit home. Okay, And it's beginning to hit home in a big way. So 20% CapEx reduction is a big deal. That's not a small reduction for a company the size of Shell. That's, that's billions, billions of dollars. So this is all historical. Let me show you forward looking just for CapEx. So if you take a look um, at CapEx looking forward, um, the sort of industry consensus was that coming forward from here, CapEx would be broadly speaking flat maybe up a little bit depending upon how you look. Keep in mind this is not everybody. This is just the oil majors, the listed companies we were talking about. This excludes the NOCs and, and like the US independents. So there, there's a layer of companies out there. This represents about a third of total upstream spend. So if total upstream spend is about 700 billion plus or minus, this is 270. So broadly speaking, say a third. Now, if we take the views of that, up until recently, the industry consensus was that CapEx would be broadly flat, call it like that. When I presented this, a variant on this presentation at the Woodrow Wilson School down in Princeton in October, uh, I had proposed that first gray line just beneath the, the flat line. And that at the time was considered a very radical, and I threw it in there, and I was like, wow, that seemed pretty radical and not very well justified, but okay. I think it's going to be something like that. And then if I start taking a look at what Shell's doing, that gives me that dotted line, the dotted gray line. Okay, and that's, that's rolling off 80 billion in CapEx over the next two or three years out of 270. And if I take a look at Hess's experience, and Hess is about a year ahead of Shell, they're down 30%. So if I take a look at Hess, it's worth, it's even, even worse. So right now, what we see is a significant pressure on CapEx emerging on the oil majors. This should not be assumed to be a CapEx on, on everybody the same way, but it is on the oil majors. Uh, essentially, efficiency gains historically 1.2% per year for oil usage in what we, the Hungarians would call BKIDUK or peacetime. It's a normal. In stress times, 2% efficiency gains are possible. Uh, for six recent quarters, not in the last two quarters, but the U.S. has seen 3.8%. So probably if, you're, if you can't get more oil and you have to reduce oil consumption by a percent and a half every year, and the max efficiency gain you can get is, let's say, three, right? Then your GDP growth is going to be capped out around a percent and a half, somewhere between a percent and two percent. And that's what we've seen so far. So, so that question is, can we break through of that or not? You know, in Europe, they certainly haven't. In the U.S., we're on the cusp of that. Is that because the Chinese are out of the market right now for oil, or is it because the U.S. is producing more oil? I don't know the answer to that. So... Demand-constrained models dominate thinking about oil demand, right? Those like BP. Um, the data, in my opinion, have not supported these models in recent years. The data do fit a supply-constrained model. We do see that we, we appear to be oil short. You know, whether, whenever there's incremental oil, it's quickly soaked up. Oil prices have not collapsed, despite the fact that, that oil prices should be on the razor's edge and OPEC and all this sort of stuff. Nobody's nervous. They're all investing like it's going out of style. Actually, it is going out of style. Um, so the, the data really doesn't support a demand-constrained model in general in the last several years. A supply-constrained approach may not be applicable if China falters for non-oil-based reasons. So if there's a, a readjustment for, for domestic reasons having to do with, with internal 
uh, issues in that economy. If the U.S. short-term latent demand is sated, or if supply growth is very robust. For supply growth model to be valid, oil must be holding back GDP growth as an implicit element of model construct. Okay. Um, so to conclude here, in essence, we are looking at a situation where oil may be constraining the OECD economies. I think it probably is. I think China will return to the markets. I think price pressures will return to the markets, and pressures will resume on the advanced economies because China is going to take its increment over a period of time. So with that, uh, I'll conclude this part of the talk and, and happily take any questions that we can have. Great. Thank you again very much. Um, we have about 10 or 15 minutes for questions, uh, and we would just ask folks to please uh, line up and just ask questions from the microphone up to the side, uh, just so that we can actually capture all of your questions uh, for the video and the online audience. Um, and it looks like we have a few. Uh, and again, if you could just please state your name, affiliation, um, and make your question uh, a question as opposed to a statement so we can get through as many as we can. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank you for a very stimulating talk. Uh, the data was just overwhelming, and I'd love to get the, the paper. Uh, so please, I don't know, give us the link somewhere so we can get it. Um, it'll, it'll, the, it'll be on. Jesse, you'll have it, yeah. Very good, thank you. Oh, okay. Um, okay, the first, there are many points that were controversial in your talk, I'm sure you know. That, that's what I do. Um, that's great. Um, but the primary one is that you didn't mention natural gas. I mean, natural gas obviously has taken a lot of, uh, especially in the United States, a lot of demand uh, away from oil. Um, so, you know, so that somehow that has to be factored in in your, in your analysis. And I'll just leave it that because that's yeah. okay. there are lots of interesting points. Yeah, I mean, this presentation, as long as it is, it's quite a dense presentation. And if I had longer, I'd, I'd take more time. Um, I, I only spoke about natural gas indirectly in that uh, consumption of goods. You can, the ethylene, ethane ethylene, that's a natural gas product. Um, and in heating, the heating oil that you can see is down. And a lot of that's going to be people swapping to, to natural gas. So um, yeah, natural gas is there. Uh, you know, we did a, a, a capstone workshop here about natural gas vehicles four years ago. Um, if you're asking me whether we're, you know, the, the, the US is on the cutting edge of what should be happening there, the answer is no. But natural gas continues to be positive. But this, this is really about oil rather than gas. Okay. Uh, Mark Rodevin, I'm here at uh, Columbia. Uh, question again is on supply, which is your focus. And uh, my, my question has to do with the tar sands, which uh, in Alberta are considered to be a Saudi Arabia. So yeah. you're talking about drilling expense and the capitalization of, uh, you know, EMP and so forth. Uh, did your analysis really include the mining of, you know, hydrocarbons and so forth? Yeah. So if you look, the Canadian production there was in included oil sands in the last uh, seven years are up 1.2 million barrels, something like that. Um, if you take a look at the Canadian Association of Petroleum Producers cap, they'll spot you about 150,000 barrels per day per year from the oil sands. Um, the oil sands are, are quite expensive. They're right at the top of the cost curve. So there's some, some issues there. You know, I don't have any controversy. I think that the, the increase which the Canadians are showing, which is to 3 million barrels or something by 20-something, uh, you know, I, I think that that will happen. The oil sands are developing pretty well. But they're not, they're, they're not a resource that you can roll out a million barrels at a time. You know, 150,000 is good. 250,000 is a really good year for them. They've had big years. Last year they did 450,000 barrels per day. But, but that's because there was a clustering of projects. So it, it's important, but it's not, you, you can't scale it at this pace that, you know, that would be optimal. Could you comment on the supply side on two issues? One, uh, with uh, non-core assets being, uh, as you said, being sold off, a lot of private equity money is moving in to develop yeah. that, so how that's hitting supply. The second issue is also the, um, the country-based uh, oil companies like Pemex and the like. Yeah. I mean, they are, Pemex in particular, is now changing their constitution right. to bring spending in, and there's a lot of, I've worked with them, there's, there's a lot in the ground because they've been uh, CapEx star for years. So how those two things are uh, influencing your supply picture? Yeah. So the private equity funds are just swapping out strategics, right? And uh, it'll be a good time. It's a great time to be a private equity fund because if you count up the buyers, the strategic buyers for these major assets like Wheatstone and 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 um, uh, these other big plays that are being big 
assets are being sold. They're being sold eight, ten billion dollars at a pop. Okay. Now, if you count up the buyers for there are about seven of them, right? There's the Saudis, the Qataris, the Kuwaitis, maybe. Then you have the three major Chinese oil companies. This is going to be a big change. I think the, the, the Chinese oil companies are going to be big time into this change right now. They're a little slow to recognize it because you have to be thinking more in terms of national priorities rather than rate of return priorities. But the Chinese will be big very soon, and that's going to have some interesting political tensions. We will have discussions in this room in the next 18 months on what if the Chinese buy everything. It's coming. Um, and then maybe you have the Russians, Rosneft, and Gazprom, maybe, maybe ONGC. You run out of buyers pretty quickly. And all these oil majors are going to be dumping assets at the same time. And there are not going to be any buyers out there. So suddenly you're going to run short on assets. And now you're going to say, OK, where can I find $8 billion? And you're going to find Carlisle and Texas Pacific Group and KKR and these massive funds now taking big positions at really bad prices from the oil majors because they're going to have to dump them just to raise cash. So. You know, the oil majors are very slow on, on understanding what's happening to them because they don't use supply constraint forecasting, right? So that's made them inherently optimistic. Oh, prices will rise. And they're not rising. They don't know why they're not rising. But now they're in a position as, oh, we better sell something because our investors want dividends, right? So there's going to be a point here where there's a fire sale. Yeah, if you're one of the big private equity funds, you know, this is good. there's going to be some significant opportunities out there. So that's one. The other thing that's happening now, so that the fact that prices are not rising also affects the the petro exporting countries, the Saudis, the Russians, the Alaskans, um, and, and the Mexicans as well. Those guys, remember, those guys in the period from 2003 to 2011 made a killing by not producing any more oil. They made a killing just because prices moved up. So the Saudis today are producing what they were producing in 1979. But they're making a pile of money because the prices have gone up so much. Well, guess what? Prices aren't going to go up now. So if these guys want more revenue, they're going to have to increase production. And that's going to force them to liberalize these countries, like Mexico. But we will see more of this. This is why if you're an oil company, in my opinion, now you take the under. right? You take the Nigerias, you take the Mexicos, you take the Argentinas and the Russias, because you assume that the pressures are going to come your way. Hi, Jared Anderson. I'm managing editor of Breaking Energy. Uh, I was wondering what your preferred oil supply demand data sources are, in your view of Jody. And are you bullish on Iraq, or what, what's your view of Iraq? Um, my primary data source is the EIA. I, I, I guess I'll, I'll leave it at that. Um, I, I don't use Jody too much, but I, I do appreciate it. Um, Iraq is underperformed. I mean, if you take a look at it, you know, there's U.S. and there's Canada, right? And you'd really think that Iraq would certainly have displaced Canada, right, at a minimum. But it really hasn't. I mean, it's a 1.2 million barrels. U.S. oil supply growth in the next 12 months will be as much as all of oil supply growth in Iraq since Saddam Hussein fell, pretty much. So, you know, the Iraqis should be producing more. They certainly could. Will the politics sustain it? You know, it doesn't look like it's going the right direction. Uh, Bill Lowe with Third Corner Capital. It's an outsourced business development and corporate development firm. When discussing CapEx, you mentioned upstream spend and uh, involving service and equipment rentals. What's your opinion regarding multinational oil companies partnering with these local upstream service providers, specifically in Western Africa, uh, more specifically in the Angolan market? Have you seen an appetite for investment into these local service provider uh, companies, or is this something where the level of risk is a bit high, given that these local companies are, are less so institutionalized? Yeah, pass. I, I, I'll be honest with you, I don't know about partnering in in Western Africa, so I'll just have to pass on that. I mean, I, I think oil companies will do what they can to get, you know, the, uh, who is it, uh, Christophe de Marguerite? I, I think he was here in this room, too. And he said, oh, wouldn't it be great if all the oil was in, like, suburban Paris or stored in nice nice uh, places, you know, in, 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 in Pennsylvania and we could easy to get to? But the truth is that most of the oil nowadays is in difficult to get to places. Um, the oil companies, um, that's what they do, you know. They, they, they find ways to, to get it out of difficult places, and there are different ways of doing that, but, but they're, you know, the, that's a core competence for them. So. So please join me in thanking uh, Stephen Kopitz once again. Thank you very much.